to introduce uh, this panel of um, uh, very experienced security people. Uh, they, they have different titles. Um, they have been through a lot. And what is very interesting is uh, some of them work with each other and eat at each other's companies, but, and, but not, they're all working at different places. So first I'd uh, like to mention Sunil. Sunil Sushadri is the CISO of Visa. I first met Sunil when he was the CISO of the New York Stock Exchange. And uh, he took me in an awesome tour of the stock exchange and he talked about securing the stock exchange and how that was like securing the Pentagon in many ways that people don't realize. Um, now Sunil's company does uh, 11,000 uh, transactions per second, if I remember right, or something like that. Each one of these has to be secured, and they're the uh, principal, they're the, uh, principal payment provider worldwide. Uh, we need security over there. Then, uh, then we have Abe. Abe is uh, the head of security at Cavium, um, all the way from the financial industry to the technology industry. Some very different challenges. Um, um, and Abe and I have been working for a while now uh, together. I know exactly what kind of challenges he faces. And then over on the other end, we have Leslie. Uh, Leslie is a veteran of Silicon Valley security. She was the CISO before the term CISO was well understood or well, uh, you know, people didn't know what a CISO did. So Leslie was at uh, the CISO of Sun, of uh, Microsystems, and then later on at Juniper. So please uh, welcome the panel and we'll get started. You know, security wasn't always like this. So my first question to a panelist is, when was it in your career that you started noticing that something has changed in security. I mean, I'm sure there's a, a few things that you'd like, uh, you'd like to remember. Was it really that different 15, 20 years ago? Uh, Leslie, why don't we start with you? Um, it was very, very different. Um, uh, back then, I, I think we were still combating um, security problems with rocks and sticks. I, I kind of, it's uh, even just that long ago, um, but 15, plus a little over 15 years, um, it was uh, still like caveman style. Uh, we had a few people that would uh, uh, be part of a network security group. They would be hidden behind the door in the dark. They would all wear black. We would slide pizza under the door and uh, then they would do these uh, scary things. Um, you have to remember security is uh, you know, an industry that uh, only recently um, probably within the last 10 to 12 years, actually started developing some standards uh, to begin to professionalize itself. So um, the term hacker is, uh, is uh, an affectionate term that we have for ourselves because uh, many of us started out that way a long time ago. Sunil? I, I think it's, it's morphed over the period of the last decade. I think it continues to gain sort of intensity in uh, it's, it's a visibility and awareness. I think the challenges have been there. By and large, technologists have dealt with the problem, so the C-suite hasn't, they haven't had to worry about it. But the dynamics of the game has changed. I think cybersecurity broadly over the period of the decade hasn't kept up with the innovation that has happened in technology at large. And as Rahul talked about in his opening state, I mean, note, he talked about essentially the vector, the attack vectors are broadened across, if you break up the OSI stack, you will find just a variety of different ways you can hack into an environment. With that, the risks have broadened. There have been much more issues that have become public. The regulations have woken up. There has been an expectation, especially of publicly traded companies, in terms of how they have to deal with cybersecurity issues, more so than ever before. That has woken up, essentially, the C-suite and the board of companies that they've had to get smarter about how they deal with this. It is a business issue. It's become job number one for boards. So has it changed? Absolutely, it has. Okay. I guess I'll address more of the technical side of it. Um, so when I used to work for Leslie 15, 20 years ago, at Sun yeah, Micro... I'm sorry, yes, he knew me when I was tall, thin, and my hair was dark. <laughs> 
Um, and, and I think Abe had hair. Yes, I did. Um, at that time, we didn't have to worry about, we only had to worry about a few ports and protocols that were open. Uh, and you would literally count the number of things that could pass through a firewall on a single hand. Uh, but uh, today, if you look at the applications, there are thousands of them. And um, so that has certainly changed. The perimeter has blurred from uh, very distinct uh, to almost non-existent. So to me, um, I no longer have to think in, in binary terms of the um, hard and crunchy exterior and the soft and chewy interior. It's more, uh, it's all blended into one big mush. So it's much harder to do. Thank you. So, um, you know, the topic of this panel was about, it's kind of been said uh, previously in the last uh, hour or so. So cybersecurity has exploded. The innovation in technology has been very rapid. Security innovation hasn't been able to keep up for whatever reason. So uh, that doesn't really help you guys. I mean, you still have to make sure that the lights stay on from a security perspective. And you, you're kind of like working with more and more of your hands, tied be, with the shrinking budget, it's the same budget, slightly more, maybe a lot more. How do you deal with this situation, which is, what is your main guiding principles around, okay, so you've got this big a problem, your budget is growing, but not so fast. What do you guys do? So, Leslie? Well, um, uh, like any problem that you have, you need to break it down into you know, uh, manageable parts and pieces. Um, uh, for example, when I um, uh, went to, uh, to Juniper, and if there's any Juniper folks in the room, hello. Um, I was the very first CISO for that organization, and by that time the company had been around for 16 years without any security controls, um, formal security controls internally. And so you could see that as sort of an overwhelming challenge. Um, but you know, you, you, you sort of break that down and look for things that can help you uh, with your most critical tasks. My task when I went in was to protect the intellectual property of the company, and so we focused there. And um, uh, so we began to uh, work uh, primarily with uh, engineering because the rest of the company was kind of taken care of by socks and all that stuff that they had been working on. So that, that, was, that was adequate. So, um, you know, bringing in uh, very specific technologies that can focus and uh, take care of, you know, your largest need, most specific need, uh, like I did with the, uh, the intellectual property. So, Sunil, my, my, my sort of north star, so to speak. I mean, in terms of guiding thoughts, I, you know, I, I, I believe in two things. One is surround yourself with people who are better than you in what you do. That takes a certain level of self-awareness. That takes a certain mindset. To when you hire people, every single time that are better than you. You do that, the possibility of what that team can do for you, for the company, is immense. Yeah, the possibilities are just simply fantastic as to how they can help you protect the company. Second thing is, there is no one single solution out there because it's, it's a very broad sort of a sea when you talk about cybersecurity challenges. My view is have a defense in depth approach, have a defense in depth strategy. There is no implicitly one solution you can trust, you can bet on. Keep it layered, keep it complementary, not necessarily redundant, but have a way of attesting to its effectiveness so that you're just not sinking money into a black hole. So you guys make it sound so easy and one would almost like to but I always like to say, okay, well, what do you guys really do? So double-clicking down, when you, when you try to do what you try to do, what is your uh, biggest challenge? I mean, you have people that rely on you and people that you have to lead and people that, um, that you work with, your vendors. So what is your biggest challenge? Just to maybe start with eight. Uh, sure. <clears throat> no matter how much security awareness you, you have for your employees, they'll always be the one who will click on something. So the way I approach my um, area to protect is assume that at any time somebody or the other will always click on the thing. My job is to make it that in spite of them clicking it, they're still safe. 
and there are products out there that you should look at and, and if you find the right products, um, you have to wor worry less and less about the human factor. Uh, he, he meant my product, but that's a different thing. <laughs> we can talk about that later. <laughs> so Neil, what's your view? How do you go uh, about, uh, what's the biggest challenge? You know, what, what, the, there are a few challenges. I think you know, one of the biggest ones is I think in Silicon Valley especially, the love for innovation is just fantastic. And I don't think cybersecurity necessarily has kept up with that love for innovation in the software space. Security has always fallen behind. It's never, it's always been bolted on by and large. It continues to be bolted on by and large, more so than ingrained and built into the fabric of what we use within technology in every company. So that, when you apply that to whether it's cloud computing or virtualization or Internet of Things, there are still very fundamental challenges in this space that are unaddressed. So if you're on the sell side of it, it's an opportunity, but if you're a consumer of it, you have to think through as to how you're gonna deal with that. I would say that rate of change is probably one of the biggest challenges that I foresee. Uh, and when we, when we think about um, you know, most of the people that we interact with, and perhaps most of the people in this room over here, um, there are some VCs, there are some businessmen over here. I think most of them are not cybersecurity experts or security experts or even technologists. So if you had to um, describe uh, your side of the world, if you had to, for example, have a conversation asking for more money, more resource, uh, talk about a clear and present danger, or even that's not important for us. How do you, what is your advice to other uh, non-technical people, venture capitalists, on uh, you know, how to think about the security world? How do you have that conversation? What is your personal way of doing it? Maybe let me start with you. Um, certainly. Um, well, first of all, I think, um, uh, you know, it's not like a, as a CISO, sometimes people, you know, walk in sort of, you know, big hat, no cattle, sort of, you know, I'm the new sheriff in town. And nothing can be more offending than, than probably walking in like that. So I think, number one, you know, building a relationship uh, and demonstrating to the, uh, the board or executives that you, you understand what their business is all about. You know, you're not just there to, you know, be Dr. No and shut everything down. So I think really important um, is to, you know, be able to speak the, the, the language of business and explain to them um, you know, uh, it's, it's not to blind them with science, everything you know about security or technology. Um, you know, we're all in Silicon Valley, we're all really smart, everybody, you know, we don't have to uh, try to one-up one another. But I think demonstrating that you understand their business and that um, bringing them real data versus um, uh, chicken little histrionics, you know, um, the house is on fire and having, you know, serious conversations. That's how I would approach it, um, and, and how I have with um, um, non-technical non uh, board members and executives. Uh, sure, um, I was, uh, when I was sitting in the back there waiting for, uh, to come up here, uh, the previous session somebody said, uh, give up the expectation of having perfect security, and I couldn't agree with that statement more. Um, it, having a perfect security is just unrealistic, so I think not only should you focus on what is the most important thing that you need to protect, but assume that you're going to be breached. Um, I always uh, told my customers, uh, there are two types of companies, those who have been breached and those who have been breached and don't know about it. Um, so I think that no matter how good a security, how defense in depth and layered you have, you should always have a good incident response plan. Right. So, you know, broadly speaking, I would, my, my views are, you know, cybersecurity is, is really not, I think, in terms of how you describe it to the board or your CEO, it's, it's really not a goal you're trying to hit. It's more of a journey. And how you explain the journey to the board? I would say other things that comes to mind would be have a program that reflects a roadmap, that reflects how you continue to improve the maturity of your security posture for the company over a period of time. Keep it data driven to the extent possible so you take the emotion out of the equation in terms of how you explain it to the board. Uh, keep it metric and 
as Salim talked about, I mean, sometimes it can be data intensive, but it's got to be it's got to be meaningful in terms of the the kind of metrics you put forward to the board. So take emotion out of the equation, keep it data centric, metric centric, explain the journey, have a roadmap, and relentlessly execute against it with the ability of having the flexibility in terms of dealing with incidents issues as they come along the way. Uh, I double click on that question, and again for all three of you, um, if you if you choose to, what, what advice would you like to give our venture capitalists specifically as to how to think about cybersecurity investments? Should they stop investing, or should they invest? I think it's too early to stop investing. I, I, my point of view would be, uh, this is my, this is my desire more so than anything else. Uh, my desire to from cybersecurity companies is. I want to see more open framework, open source, leveraging solutions out there. I want to see less of closed door appliance centric models. I want every security solution to be API centric, API driven, so I can stitch it all together. Because think about it, in any company you go to where this matters, you have structured data, you have on some unstructured data, you have to log it, you have to normalize it, you have to ingest some threat intelligence into your sensors. Perhaps you have a data science program behind it. You have to take the data, correlate the events, looking for collusions across different security sets. Then you have incident management and metrics. There are literally dozens and dozens of security solutions that make up the stack. There are very few companies that make sure that, that talk to each other. You have to look for API-enabled solutions. If you don't stitch these things together, you will have multiple sort of frameworks, multiple point solutions, multiple, essentially, portals to be able to manage it. It's an effective at best. If you're looking at uh, funding a, a product, besides making sure that it's a good product, I would say, how, do, how can that product be indispensable for the customer? Uh, for instance, I'm right now, uh, I'm an early adopter of security products, and I'm looking at one of the products that uh, Gaurav's uh, current company has, and I've been uh, working with it for the past few months, and um, it has become the foundation of the rest of my security strategy. Uh, anytime we have an issue, that's the product I like to go to first to see what it says and then sort of uh, corroborate the others and see if they're saying the same thing. So if, you can, if you're looking at funding a company, I would say pick a product that can become the foundation or indispensable or synonymous with uh, a security for the company. Uh, Leslie, what's your view on um, sure. advice uh, I, to VCs? Well, um, I think um, within the last couple of weeks, I read an article that said um, that there's more money than there are ideas out there. So I think in some sense you're challenged to find, you know, what's the, the, the new, new thing? What's the next thing? And, um, you know, in some sense, um, the more that, that you're supplying uh, funds and I, and support to in uh, companies that are building uh, solutions that are kind of looking down a straw um, you know that's going to be more difficult for us as an enterprise to absorb um, one of the CIOs I've worked for uh, in the last five years was oh you security people you're just all about tools what's the next tool what's the next one you know you just want money for tools and so you have to realize um, that we may be very interested in, in embracing um, your technologies, the, uh, early um, items, uh, but we may be running up against some sort of you know backstop that says, you know, um, gee, it's like you know tool du jour. So just be careful about that. So I, th I think being judicious about where you're um, uh, making your investments, and I think it is tough. Um, you know, I think there is a. Uh, we're in a, in a bit of a lull right now of ideas, um, so the, the, probably the organizations you've invested in now, I would say, uh, work with them uh, really, really uh, strongly. So um, we heard open APIs, we heard uh, talk outcomes, we heard uh, make a product which is um, 
something you can't live without or something that can become foundational. Uh, we also heard a whole bunch of uh, gems of information from the last few panelists. Uh, and there's uh, some entrepreneurs out here, so any additional advice that the three of you have for uh, people that might want to start businesses uh, and trying to solve security problem? I'll answer just, uh, um, I think there was a, on, the, on the previous panel, I'm not sure if it was Salim or Brendan um, or Charles who said it, but um, uh, you know, when you're bringing in something, you know, don't try to blind me with science or, or, or you know, razzle dazzle, whatever. Really be able to you know, tell me how this is gonna solve a business problem. Because you know, I mean, the, the title of this talk is about the enterprise. So it's, it's not, um, you know, some next cool thing. It's how is this gonna solve this for the enterprise? Um, you know, like I said, we're all technologists. You know, it's not really gonna blind me with all this great science, machine learning, data science. Um, we, we all went to the same schools, so thanks. So Neil Ray, uh, before we open it up to questions. So a great portion of the uh, breaches are due to compromising someone's account credentials. Uh, whether it's through phishing or other means. And uh, today we still, on just about every place I look, I can't even find a place that doesn't have this, we use shared secrets. Usernames, uh, passwords, um, even the six digit codes are all shared secrets. So if you break in to a central place, all bets are off. 20, well, 30 years ago, we invented digital signatures to eliminate that problem. But we still have, you know, we still rely on at least one or more of the factors as being shared secrets. When do we finally make the move off of shared secrets to, you know, zero knowledge um, authentication? From my point of view, I think um, we've already, first of all, certificates were great. They were just too difficult to manage, right? So, um, right. You're talking about um, digital, signatures. digital signatures, okay. So I'm thinking that the way we've moved past a lot of that is through multi-factor authentication, to the just-in-time stuff. I know that you know every time I, I go to do an expense report on Zoho, you know I gotta get a code. Um, it's annoying, but uh, uh, keeps things uh, safer. I think you know the the factor of using multi-factor authentication or, or two-factor to elevate privileges as well. Uh, because not all the, uh, the, the account compromises um, and breaches that are the most problematic are the ones that not only people get in, but that they're able to elevate privileges and then go uh, wreak havoc. So I think having uh, multi-factor authentication to elevate privileges or to move between segments of the network and things like that would do a lot to um, uh, slow down. I don't think it's going to stop. The, the, the sort of to that, right. right? Multi-factor, the point is that the factors themselves are shared secrets, that doesn't solve the problem. Right. Well, uh, uh, I think we're out of time, so uh, let's thank our panelists uh, for all uh, giving us all their time today.